Hello, my name is Devin, and I'll be demonstrating how to install rotary axis on a MAD series version 1 table. Before beginning, disconnect electrical power to the control panel and follow any necessary lockout tagout procedures. Remove the horizontal wire duct cover in the center of the control panel. Disconnect the control and CPC cables from the torch interface board. Be sure to pull on the green connectors and not the small gauge wires. Remove the four bolts securing the torch interface to the back plane with a Phillips head screwdriver. Retain these bolts for later. Mount the torch interface onto the supplied bracket using the four M5 bolts, washers, and lock nuts. You will need a Phillips head screwdriver and an 8mm wrench. Insert the bolts from the bottom to make sure that there's sufficient clearance above the power supply fan when reinstalled. One last thing is to be sure that you install the torch interface onto its bracket with the control port facing to the left. We can now set the torch interface aside while we prepare the power supply. Due to space constraints inside of the control panel, it is much easier to connect the servo power supply cable to the servo power supply before attaching it to the back plane. The servo power supply cable has a small window in the outer jacket removed exposing the braided shielding. Install this window into the clamp on the power supply bracket. Make sure that the wire is totally encompassed in the round section of the clamp and that we are not going to pinch any wires while tightening it down. Tighten it snug, but do not over tighten because you can damage the cable. Loop the cable over the fan and insert it into the top connector location. The connector is keyed and cannot be plugged in backwards. Now that all the preparation work is done, we can install the components into the control panel. First, install the bonding ring terminal of the AC power in cable supplied in the kit using an M5 panhead bolt washer and star washer. This is installed into the lower left clinch nut on the back plane that is exposed. Pull the connector out of the way to the left so that we have room to install the IPC power supply. Next, take the three cables that were supplied in the kit and feed their large shielded connectors through the bottom cable exit in the control panel. Feed the cables until there is enough slack remaining in the gray cables to reach the top of the control panel. Feed the black cable until you need to pick up the power supply with your second hand and then continue feeding until you can rest the power supply on the bottom of the box as shown. Attach the power supply to the back plane using three M5 panhead bolts, lock washers, and flat washers. It is helpful to have a longer reach screwdriver for this step. Insert the white end of the AC input power supply cable into the matching connector on the power supply. It is polarized and cannot be plugged in backwards. The two free ends of the AC power supply cable are labeled MAC1 and MAC2. They insert into the corresponding terminals located on the block to the left. When routing the wires, be sure to keep them at the bottom of the box mixed in with other AC high voltage signals. Next, install the fan power cable. Connect the white end of the cable to the plug on the fan. Insert the red 24 volt plus and black 24 volt common cables into their matching locations in the terminal block. It's a tight fit and I cannot fit my hands in there, but by grabbing the cable a few inches back, I'm able to push it into the spring cage without removing the power supplies. Finally, route the fan connector up into the horizontal wire duct and back over and down next to the low voltage power supply. Take the gray control cable with the RJ45 connector on it and insert it into the motor 5 position. Then, loosely route the cable over to the right following the other control signals and then down the right hand side of the box. In the video I made a small mistake here. I should have pulled the rotary axis cables behind the existing horizontal cables simply to make my life easier later on when attaching zip ties to maintain the positions of the cables. Next, we're going to install the rotary axis home switch cable, and it plugs into the right-hand side of the board where it's marked L4, and the cable will also route to the right and down out of the bottom of the box.
So now we're going to work the two cables back into the right hand side of the control box and anchor it to either the cable bundle that's already going through in the top or the zip tie anchors on the back of the box. Uh, a little trick is that the zip tie anchor you can take and tie the zip tie very loosely around the two cables you want and then slide them in and hook them over the control box bracket. Uh, it's a little bit easier than trying to get the end of the cable inside. Another thing that's important to note is that you don't over tighten the zip ties on the cables because they're small conductors inside of them and they can be damaged. You get a lot more leverage out of a zip tie than you think you would. I know this is kind of an awkward camera angle. Uh, it's a small box and I was in the way. I couldn't get a camera in closer. So here's an image that shows you the final routing when I was done. The last step is going to be to reinstall the torch interface now that it's on its new bracket. It's easier to install the control cable before you put it inside of the box. So we'll go ahead and plug that in and then reinstall the bracket to the back using those retained M5 pan head screws with the lock washers and washers that we, used, that we took out earlier. Then we'll reinstall the connectors on the CPC cable according to the instructions in the Torch Interface version 2 installation manual. For a hypertherm unit, this is typically white and black to divided arc voltage, red and black to the arc OK signal, and green and black to the torch start signal. Carefully tuck the wires back into the horizontal wire duct and then reinstall the cover. It's easier to put it in the top first and then angle it down while you push the fingers in on the bottom and it will snap into place. Next we're going to venture outside of the control box and install the rotary axis itself. First we have to position it roughly in front of the machine. I chose the front left corner because of the orientation of our room. Um, you can choose the other front right corner, but it must be aligned with the positive Y axis. Take the three cables that were fed through the box earlier and get them into some type of a little bit of an order and then pull them across over to the right hand side of the rotary axis where the matching connectors are. Each of the three cables out of the control box has a match on the rotary axis. We'll take those and connect them using the shielded connectors. Uh, take the plug end and it will line up with a key on the female end on the receptacle and then you can push in and turn the front edge of both connectors to tighten them down all the way. After tightening the connectors you can hang them into the mount by inserting the cable lifting up and then sliding down. Next we're going to connect the work lead to the rotary axis copper bar. Anytime we're making a connection to copper we want to make sure that we buff it first with a pad or fine grit sandpaper. Uh, just to get rid of any corrosion that might be there and impede the current's path. With plasma, it's really important that we make sure that the current flows where we want it to go and it doesn't find its way back through the control cables into the panel. Here's the final connection of the work lead back to the machine's bonding bar. We're going to buff the copper to make sure that we have a nice clean connection point. While I struggle to put in this last bolt, I want to mention a little bit about work lead and how we route them. You never want to take a long work lead and wrap it into a coil. That causes all kinds of electrical issues. I've got some images on our webpage that shows you the difference in the output from the plasma unit when that happens. So we would rather take that excess coil, I'm sorry, that excess work lead and route it through the ground in some type of like a straight line pattern. But the absolute best thing you can do is just cut it to length. Thanks for watching this instruction guide. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact us at support at jd2.com.